Well, the dream of any entrepreneur should be to maybe build a billion dollar company or two. But uh, hey, if you can't do that, the second best thing is to go to Necker Island with Richard Branson and do some kite surfing, don't you think? <laughs> well, there's a way to do that. There's a new uh, contest called the uh, Extreme Tech Challenge. We're going to hear about it right now with Bill Tai. Who are you? I'm uh, Bill Tai. I'm an angel investor and a partner at Charles River Ventures. And uh, tell me a little bit about where you came from. Uh, you know, I've, I've been a venture investor now for uh, since 1991. So uh, 20, 22 years, I funded maybe 100, 110 companies over that time. But I also happen to be a sponsored uh, kiteboarding athlete. Yeah, and a good one. <laughs> I'm reasonably good. Yes. Yes. I heard don't go out with Bill if you don't know what you're doing. Because <laughs> he'll do uh, circles around you, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I try to have fun with entrepreneurs on the water, so, so I, I stay with them no matter what. But you do a series of conferences or events for entrepreneurs yes. to get together around extreme sports, but then talk about enter starting companies and how to get to the next level. Right? Yeah, a while back I, I partnered up with a Red Bull athlete who's uh, Red Bull's uh, uh, athlete in kiteboarding. Her name happens to be Susie Mai, uh, spelled M-A-I, and mine is Bill Tai, spelled T-A-I, and together it spells, you know, something kind of fun and interesting. And Mai Tai. Mai Tai, there we go. So, <laughs> so we have a, a group that we call Mai Tai Global, and it's formed as a nonprofit. We actually support uh, environmental causes around the ocean. But uh, we basically harness the power of a lot of really interesting entrepreneurs that, um, that have learned to kite or want to learn to kite into a series of uh, what we call active gatherings. And we involve uh, extreme sports athletes and extreme innovators and entrepreneurs in a series of talks and discussions about what people are working on, technology trends, and then we all go hit the water. Very cool. I, I, I've always been jealous of that, but I'm not in shape enough to do the. Uh, We're going to get you in shape for that. <laughs> I'm trying. I've lost eight pounds in the good, last good. month. Good, so. good. Um, I was hanging out with uh, Gary Shapiro because I, I was on sta stage with uh, him at South by Southwest. And he runs the Consumer Electronics Show, and I heard about this contest you guys are doing. So yeah, so we've, we've managed to combine a couple of, uh, I guess, forces of nature in terms of. Uh, Harnessing the entrepreneur community around the world, which is one. Two, I think, is the uh, CES show, Consumer Electronics Show, is the world's largest technology trade show. I don't know exactly how many people attend that. Hundreds of thousands. It's big. And, yeah. uh, and then Richard Branson, who as an individual is probably one of the most iconic entrepreneurs on the planet. Yeah. And those three things together have been bundled into something called the Extreme Tech Challenge. We've lined up uh, great prizes, uh, including prizes from Rackspace. So thank you, Robert and crew. Yeah. Uh, so the winner, um, the winners of this, I guess uh, the contest is going to flow like this. We basically are going to take applications until August 31st. Okay. In the fall, we're going to let around 20 companies know that they have a shot at the finals, or sorry, the semifinals. The semifinals will invite 10 companies to present on stage at the Consumer Electronics Show with a lot of uh, fanfare and media coverage. Three of those companies will get picked to come to Mai Tai Necker uh, in February of, uh, of 2015 to spend a day on, the, on Richard's private island basically pitching him on what they're doing and trying to win the prize. And uh, the, there's actually a set of prizes that include everything from free hosting from Rackspace to uh, some uh, cash prizes that could be uh, garnered as an investment to a lot of media coverage and potentially some distribution partnerships with some of the other people involved in the contest. Very cool. Um, what's the application process like and what, and what are you guys looking for? Uh, so there's a website. So just go to extreme uh, extremetechchallenge.com and on there, there's a button. You just click it and there's a set of questions to fill out basically about you know, who you are as a team, what the market is that you're serving, uh, what is the problem you're solving and your solution for it. And we're going to filter that down. What we're looking for is really just winners. You know, so we're basically trying to aggregate people that aspire to be uh, what Richard Branson represents, which is kind of you know work hard, play harder attitude, and winning people that build extremely interesting companies. Yeah. So um, so let's talk about you and what you've seen in the lab because you funded helped fund Twitter and uh, I mean I, the list goes on and on. What are you seeing today? Uh, you know, so I, I do have kind of a, a little bit of an intellectual framework on how I've seen the tech 
industry evolve over the years. I, I actually was trained as a semiconductor chip designer, if you can wow. believe that. I came out here for the start of a company in the old, old days, uh, LSI Logic, yeah. that was uh, founded by the former CEO of Fairchild Semiconductor, which is kind of was, which at the That's old school, man. <laughs> very, very old school. <laughs> I've lived in the Valley since 71, and my dad was an engineer at, at Ampex and at Lockheed, and, and those guys were the gods of their day, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I came out here in 1984 originally, and the back fence of the apartment complex I lived in was C.J. Olson Cherry Orchard, if you can remember that. So In Sunnyvale. Sunnyvale, exactly. I, so I, that, picked, I picked cherries there. So that entire area was basically fruit farms, yeah. you know, but uh, over the years it's obviously transformed into something radically different. But um, I think in that era, the type of technology company that got funded was essentially a company that uh, packaged physics. So the job of the startup then was to take hardcore technology and make it somewhat usable by putting it in packages. And that was kind of wave one. So there were a lot of companies in that era. Um, I funded a lot of, of semiconductor companies in kind of like the earlier uh, part of the, uh, or actually the later part of the 80s, early 90s. The, the second wave following that was taking those things that were then kind of like little Lego blocks and assembling them into systems. So wave two, in my opinion, was sort of uh, uh, systems, switches, routers, hubs, computing platforms. Wave three was taking those and connecting the, all those things up into what we see today as the internet infrastructure. So kind of LAN, WAN, data centers. I actually founded a company in that era that went public in 2000. Uh, so you guys are hosting, but yeah. I was the founder of a company called the iAsia Works. We had data center operations in 11 countries throughout Southeast Asia. Wow. And our cover was a beautiful cover on the IPO. It was uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Solomon Brothers all on one cover, which um, th didn't happen it's very, very often. Still rare today. Still rare. And, uh, and so I think those three waves uh, le leading up to that infrastructure set, I think, created the world we live in today, yeah. which is basically a world where the infrastructure is available through a browser. And I think the world then became one that was primarily a, a wave of companies that was user interface. And so if you think about you know, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, all that genre of company worth hundreds of billions of dollars it's essentially user interface to data coming off the cloud. Yeah. And I think the wave that we're just entering as a result, the companies that won in their segments were the ones that really had a handle on their, on their data. So we, we hear this you know, overused term of big data, but that's where we are today. It's companies that basically make the handling storage analysis uh, presentation of data to understand your competitive advantage. That's, I think, the next wave that, yeah. that I'm looking at. Well, I, I call that contextual computing, right? There you go. Yes, your yeah. book is, addresses all of it. It really is. The unstructured data today was too expensive in the past to store or process. And now I think the cost structure allows you to keep it and pull information out of it. So now you can take data that was basically just thrown away and really pull interesting, valuable insight out of it. Any, any examples of companies that are hot right in your mind right now? Maybe not hot economically, but sure. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, I'm, ones I'm that you're excited by a little biased, but uh, I'm I'm really excited about a little company called Treasure Data that I guess is not so little anymore. It was a company that launched its product about 18 months ago. First six months, customers uploaded a billion rows of data. The next four months, 100 billion rows of data. The next five months, a trillion rows of data, and they're ingesting about a trillion rows of data every five weeks now. But Whoa. massive customers, you know, it's 2% uh, of Toyota's uh, hybrid automobiles are poured into the system. Companies like Genentech, GRI, Yahoo, they're on this. 3,000 3, companies are on the system in 18 months. A trillion rows of data every, every five, five weeks. Five weeks. Five weeks. I, I remember when uh, Jim Gray at Microsoft showed me a, the first terabyte database. You know? Yeah. And that seems really quaint now. <laughs> yes, yeah. I mean, data, I mean, da I think... Venture capital and angel bets on data in general are going to be reasonably good because, as we all know, data is just yeah. exploding. And there's a lot of things that can be done with it now that couldn't be done before. Yeah, and there's a lot of new database innovation. You know, Hadoop and Cloudera, Cloudera just got $750 million of yes. investment, right? Yes, $4 billion market cap, if That's I'm not mistaken. Crazy. Well, it tells you. I think, you know, we've, we've seen the disaggregation of, uh, or the virtualization, so to speak, of things like, you know, I think the whole computing ecosystem was sort of the disaggregation of IBM. 
And anytime you sort of uh, liquefy it, the market gets bigger. So the aggregate market cap kind of exploded. And we're at the point now, I think, where we're, we're, we're not really disaggregating, but we're augmenting what is represented by the market value of companies like Oracle and SAP and Sybase and Teradata. Uh, and I think every time I've seen a wave like this happen, the size of market value ends up being kind of you know, a 10x. Yeah. And so I don't know what the market cap of all those database kind of companies are, but it's, it's hundreds of billions. So could we have a thousand billion of market cap there over a period of 15 or 20 years? It's theoretically possible. So I think that, that in my mind is what's defining the opportunity set that drives the market values of things like a cloud error at four billion as a startup. Yeah, that's not crazy. Um, my theory is that investors look for things that are gonna be hot in 18 to 36 months. Is that a good theory? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it- Because uh, you're, you're trying yes, to skate I, where the puck is gonna be, right? The short answer is yes. And that's one of the big changes. Like if you think about what the venture industry was like in the early 90s when the capital requirement for companies was closer to 50 to 100 million to find product market fit that would take five to seven years yeah. to get like a product Apple, out. Like an Apple or, an, uh, uh, or all those companies in that genre, the yeah. late it, 70s, early 80s. It took a while to get products out. Yeah. So, so as an investor then, you know, especially if you were working in raw technology, you're trying to figure out where the puck would be when your product came out three to five years later for the market adoption curve to hit a few years after that. So you were looking out five or six or seven years. And I think when it shifted to more of a UI type of uh, value add, um, you could actually find product market fit in five, four, five, six months. And I was one of the very early, I was actually the very first angel to commit to Tango. And when they launched, I think they found product market fit in about a week. Is it, wow. they, it, it, uh, I guess it's, uh, a little, a little while now since it's three years ago, but when they launched their product, they were able to get a million users in 10 days, which- That's uh, crazy. Had happened before. Because ICQ in 96 uh, took six weeks to get 65,000 users, and yeah. then it, it slowly built to 100 million users over the next year, and it sold to, to AOL for 400 million, something like that. Yeah. And, and that was the successful company of, of that of the late 90s, right? Yeah, yeah. Now you have to have a million users in 10 days. In 10 days. <laughs> to get everybody's attention. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, there aren't a lot of co companies like that, at, but you know, Tango did break out early. You know, and if, if you clock back even just a few years prior to that, when my partner George seeded Twitter, um, I hired George into CRV and thank, thank God for that. But uh, when we seeded Twitter, the, uh, the smartphone platform that was leading the market at the time was the Trio. I think the model number might've been the 760. Yeah. And uh, Twitter, in that environment, took two years to get a million users, if I remember my, my numbers correctly. You're probably right. I, I was 13,000th user, and I started in November of 96, and it launched in March of 96. Or yeah. Uh, 2006, sorry. Uh, so, it, yeah, it was a slow thing. Yes. Know, kind of yeah, and I did have an early account, which I dropped because I changed my user handle. And I, I got a new account in March 2007, and I think I was around... Uh, uh, a million users yeah. at that time. It's crazy. Um, is it crazy to see a company like WhatsApp, you know, first of all, get turned down by Facebook and Twitter because they wanted to work and just get a job? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then in four years, create a company that has $16 billion of value? 19. 19 so, well, billion. I guess it depends on uh, the, how you yeah, count it. Yeah, the, okay, the, $19 billion dollars of value? Yeah, the stated deal value, I think, was 19, and there was 16 up front, whatever the deal value was. It's, it's, it's all so big that it's almost hard to process. Um, well, you know, I think we're in a world now where the user markets are so big. When I think about what constitutes a market valuation for a company, there's two major pieces. One is, what is the ultimate size of market? The bigger the market, the bigger the value can be. And what is the growth rate that proves that it has access to that? And then, of course, the monetization fills in behind that. And you know, WhatsApp has built an incredibly big footprint into a massive market. And uh, so, you know, I, I, as a strategic buyer, I can definitely see why it represented a good chunk of the market value of Facebook because they need. They, they can't acquire little companies and move the needle. Yeah. They need to acquire big footprints and there aren't a lot of them out there. There's some kids yelling in the background, so that's, that's probably what Rocky and JJ are trying to figure out <laughs> on their headphones. Um, 
Where, uh, let's go through some spaces. Wearables. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, I, I, my theory is Apple and Google are coming in and are going to change the market quite a bit. So, sure. so what kind of opportunity is there to start a new company in that space? You know, I, I love that space. You know, I think as, a, as, a, as an athlete as well, I, uh, if, if you follow me on Facebook, you'll see when I go kiteboarding, I always have these pictures at the end of my sessions of a red squiggly line that's basically GPS traces. And I, I basically will record my rides, upload them to uh, Connect, Garmin Connect. A lot of people use Strava and I will eventually probably migrate to that. But I think athletes and, and people every day like to measure everything about their day. And so I think, um, that's another example of unstructured data that was just being thrown away since the dawn of human history that is now able to be recorded cheaply uh, a at, at, a cost, at a price point that makes it viable to, to record, store, upload, process. That, that hasn't been done for you know, hundreds of thousands of years and now everybody can do it for a hundred bucks. Yeah. or less depending on what what you're looking if you if you want something that doesn't have a display it's less than a hundred dollars you know so it's accessible and it's massive and i think the changes in funding model you know we definitely as a venture industry most of the funding for uh, you know 20 years ago was hardware oriented and then we went into a, kind of a pure software mode for a while and i think things like crowdfunding and the the cost of goods in that segment now are at a point where you can put a lot of stuff on Kickstarter. Look at look at Oculus, yeah. as a there's a perfect example, right? Think of a just cool, went for two billion dollars to Facebook, right? There you go, a cool hardware product. Put it on Kickstarter. A couple million bucks rolls in to fuel it because you find an audience out there through social media that yeah. wants that product. You you garner your cash. You bring out a prototype, and bam. I just was at PCH's new lab here in San Francisco, and they have row after row after row of five axis milling machines and all sorts of uh, gear the, uh, they make a lot of the gear we buy <laughs> uh, yeah okay i gotta be careful of how much i say because uh, liam who owns pch will get mad at me but if you if you uh, get something from china it's either coming from foxconn or it's coming from pch right, right. <laughs> yeah so you know and he helps you build it right he, yeah he's helping neil young build the pono player that, that's coming out and just raised five million dollars already in kickstarter and still has 17 days to go you know it's beautiful today because i think that type of opportunity was handed to software developers when things like amazon web services and rackspace made made it really easy to interface and gave you the infrastructure and now the infrastructure to, to design, develop, bring to market a hardware product is getting handed, as you say, to, you know. But it's hard to build a watch because, you know, there's Fitbit, FuelBand, Jawbone, sure. uh, Basis, right, which sold to Intel. I just saw Jeff, who, who's the CEO of Basis yesterday. Uh, and then there's Apple and Google coming in. Right. right? And, and so that yeah, market seems boys, very crowded. With the big boys coming in, it's definitely harder. But I think there's always going to be another opportunity and who knows you know i think right now people are looking at the smart watch as a an extension that orbits around the smartphone maybe the smart watch itself becomes the hub and then you have a lot of like little tiny things extending around that i mean it you know the world has gone sort of you know big machine to terminal like mainframes and terminals to smart clients to where that smart client then becomes a hub for something else and who knows, maybe we'll have things that are sort of, you know, atomic size, yeah. you know, orbiting around your body, feeding information in and, and it's getting collected. I, hard to know what technology will bring, but it's not out of the question. Home automation. That's uh, another thing too. I mean, Nest. Nest just got sold for Google, to Google for $3 billion. Yes. And, uh, Prime Sense that does these 3D sensors just sold to Apple for $1.2 billion. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's another opportunity set. I mean, there, there's, there's... See how I'm talking, though? I'm talking about the past. Yes. So where is the future going? <laughs> Where's 18 months from now? Where, where... Well, you know, so uh, as, these things, as, as these things that in the recent past uh, are getting built to be coming to market really soon exist, I think that's why, in my view, the next wave is this data wave and things like treasure data. And treasure data is uh, getting swarmed by all the chipset guys and Internet of Things to be a platform that gets shipped with their chipset, uh, with the hardware guys' chipset, so that there's an automatic collection point in the cloud to provide value that's above and beyond a node. 
And so I think uh, as I see things like, uh, you know, Rainbird sprinkler systems and Sears garage door openers and um, locks, door locks and things like that getting attached to the internet, and they are, all of them are. Yeah. Um, you can control them through a browser at your office and they're, they're, they're collecting and streaming data all the time. Yeah. So I think in, in aggregate, and you know, so there's a couple use cases. You know, you as a, an owner of those things in your house can manage your environment at a local level, but there's also a ton of value to be unlocked in the aggregation of millions of those uh, users. I think that's why I, there's this company called Revolve that I, I have a Revolve unit. It has nine radios and it grabs uh, control of your Sonos, your Nest, your Locketron mm -hmm. locks, your mm -hmm. Philips Hue lights. I mean, the, the, the drop cams, right? Sure. There's a lot of stuff happening in the home now. Yeah. It's really cool. Well, but, it's, but that hub, I think, is going to be valuable. Yeah, it's, a, it's the integration of all of the, the heterogeneous stuff in your house, but it's also the aggregation of everyone's heterogeneous data sets, right? Because you, you could kind of see, you know, a, a map of everything from electrical usage to whatever people are doing with any one of those or all of those devices that gives you a sense for how to, you know, how to handle the world's data. Social networks. Ah, social networks, you know, so, so social networks, obviously there's the massive ones like Facebook and, uh, you know, so my bet, uh, my, my investment bets have been around two things. It's kind of, you know, the messaging layer that's um, above and beyond sort of the social sharing of, of photos and what's happening in your day to a little bit lighter weight contact points. So, I, you know, I funded both Tango and I'm on the board of Voxer, which is a real-time push to talk. And then I think there's a derivative that's coming that is sort of a, how do you take what is a massive uh, user base at Facebook and drill down into certain layers of that. As, a, as an example, I'm a seed investor in lulu.com, which is sort of, a, it's the hot or not type of company for the modern age where women rate men on everything from cheap to generous, good kisser, bad kisser, there's a bangability oh, don't index. Don't give this to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the, the bangability index gets a lot of laughs, but, and if you're a, if you're a dude, uh, you can actually see a little bit of information on yourself, not all your scores, but you could actually look at luludude.com and oh, there'll man. be a little bit of information on, on what is in the Lulu ecosystem. I'll, I'll go there when my ego needs some abuse. <laughs> <laughs> it's very fun though. So you're going to see a whole bunch of, not Facebook competitors, but things that are uh, bringing new capabilities. Yeah, to, I mean, to Facebook work. has clearly defined a, a, a broad and deep social graph and social connection pattern. And I think what, um, what companies like Lulu will, will bring is sort of an overlay network where there's a different type of value add that may not be 100% fit across yeah. what you do inside Facebook. So it's not really something that they'd want to do. But there's room, I think, for companies in the periphery to focus on certain value propositions, if you want to call it that, that uh, they won't touch. And I think the messaging space as I look at what Tango represents, Tango is an alternative social graph. It's not um, as deep as the Facebook social graph or as broad. You know, Tango, I think, is well over, you know, it's approaching 300 million members, so it's not insignificant. But what they have is basically sort of a contact database because if you use Tango, they're able to connect you instantly to other people that are connected to you in other ways that are beyond just your, your Facebook login. It's who was in your contact database. And I know you were a little worried about that because you were getting I, spammed. I still am, actually. They, they said I, they would take me out of the database. But uh, yeah, because I, I'm on so many uh, people's contact yeah. lists. Yeah. So when they get excited by something new, they, they all want to see you on there. And there's a lot of pressure from investors to ramp up to that yeah. million, dollar, million person for 10 days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And that's how they get the million people, sure. right? If I have uh, well, it's friends inviting friends. friends on my contact list and I invite them all, yeah. all of a sudden they all get uh, Tango, yeah. right? Yeah, so it's not actually Tango trying to spam you. It's that people love you, Robert. So there's lots of people that are connected <laughs> to you that want to communicate with you through Tango. So yeah. I think that that's what's happening there. Downside of being a celebrity and putting my number on, online, which it yeah. is, it's public, and my my phone number, I only have one phone and it's all public. So, But those kinds of social graphs that are sort of uh, 
mobile-based are becoming a new backbone for other sorts of monetization. So I think you probably have heard of companies like Line and Kakao Talk and yeah. companies like that, but Line has just exploded in revenue because they've become basically a backbone for gaming where a standalone game before was fun to play, but when you plug it into social backbone and then you can invite your friends and compete on scores, it can explode. And that's kind of what happened with Line and Tango, uh, Words for Friends as, a, as an example, yeah. just launched on Tango last week. Wow. So I think, you know, Zynga is seeing that, you know, there's, there's a role for mobile messaging social graphs that uh, adds value. Much like Zynga started on the Facebook social right. graph, now I think they're recognizing there is an opportunity to mobile as well. Let's go back to, because I could talk to you for hours about cars, <laughs> all sorts of fun stuff that's coming. Uh, give some tips to the people that are entering this contest. Yeah. You know, Extreme so, tech challenge. yeah, so, so we're, we're really just looking, you know, so Richard, Richard, in my view, is a winner. And uh, Richard Branson, I'm talking about, who's uh, our, our lead sort of guest judge. We also have uh, in the lineup uh, Felix Baumgartner. Wow, the guy who jumped out of space. Yes, so, wow. you know, extreme risk taker. Uh, quite so they're looking for a big idea. They're, they're not, they're not yes. looking for a copy of Instagram. They're looking for something really crazy big. They're, they're looking for game-changing people with game-changing ideas yeah. that are not afraid to, like, put it out there. You know, if you think about the level of risk associated with jumping out of a cockpit in outer space to go down to earth. And there's some film sequences that are just unbelievable yeah. where he gets a little out of kilter and it's, it's sort of like a wild spin and he's got to try to control that. I mean, think of how scary that is. If you've watched the movie Gravity, yeah. Felix has basically lived that and corrected well, that Well, there's fall. a new video of Felix's fall with five GoPros on him and it's incredible. It's, it, it's it amazing. Really incredible. Yeah, so we basically have put together a couple anchor tenant guest judges like that that are, are unafraid to try but they are, they're not wildly So you're looking risk. for the next Elon Musk, basically. Oh, boy. I, <laughs> Elon, if you want to apply, we'd love to have you. Actually, we'd love well, to have Elon's you. already there. Yes, he can, he's he can get there. his own way to Necker yeah. Island. But, but um, you know, it's about taking calculated risk. I mean, you know, like a guy like Felix isn't going to jump out of the cockpit into a vacuum without having thought about it. And when Richard plans his businesses, I mean, he's been successful over and over and over, but it hasn't been without the occasional big idea that didn't quite get there. Yeah. You know, so we're looking for people that have big ideas, have a confidence and the track record and the background to execute, either in themselves as a leader or with teams. Yeah. Uh, we're looking now what if you're, if you're a 19 year old and you don't have that track record, right? Um, you know, it's team. Would you right? turn down the Mark Zuckerberg before he started Facebook? You know, <laughs> you know I, I, I hope that I don't in, in the next one. But, you know, in fact, these contests were designed around that. You know, I, I think when I put together, uh, so this is a contest that is so, if you, so give some tips to that 19-year-old who doesn't have, uh, has not built a Facebook, has, is not Elon Musk. Sure. Today. Yeah. So right. it, it was it, Elon Musk when he was 19. Give him some advice it's to, about to win this contest. It's about credibility. Right. In the end, it's about credibility either in proof because you have a product that people are using and you can see early signs of growth and trajectory, or it's about proof by getting the right people and team to back you. So if you are somebody like that, uh, like Mark had a product that was taking off. People yeah. weren't sure at the time what it was going to be used for, but they could tell it was getting traction. Right. So I think get your product done, get it out there, get some users, show some growth. In the absence of that, if you can attract people that are great, you know, I'll give an example of a company that's not super well known yet, but um, uh, I ended up funding a gal from Australia in a company called Canva. Yep, and, I, uh, she's been here. So yeah, I, she's great. Yeah, she, yeah. She, yeah she, she, uh, remarkable woman. I mean, she, she had built a profitable business before out of college, not in a tech space. It was basically the automation of uh, the creation of, of school yearbooks. Yeah. and wanted to take ideas from her design platform and make them uh, broad, more broadly applicable to a lot of markets. And I wasn't really sure that I should fund somebody coming out of Australia that wasn't in this market, that didn't have a technical background at all. But she proved it to me. And she hired a couple of people that were lead developers on the Google Wave team. Yeah. And for her to be able to do that and bring in really talented people that believed in her, believed in her idea, and, and were willing to execute on that, that got me over the hump. That, along with Lars, Lars Rasmussen, the inventor of Google uh, Maps and Google Wave, he and I basically did that together. 
And so I think if, uh, if you're 19 and you got a brilliant idea, see what you can do to attract extreme talent and experienced uh, company builders or investors to your circle to show us that you have that DNA. It's, it's, um, it's hard, but it's really interesting that, uh, you know, I go to a lot of conferences and I hang out with, my, my best friend was one of the 12 guys who built the iPhone. How many people ever come and try to meet him? He sits in uh, Half Moon Bay Brewing Company every day, you know, and I, I, I visit him, and there's not a whole lot of people trying to get close to him, you know, but that's the kind of talent. That if is. you could convince him, yes, which would take some doing. It would. It would. Twitter tried to hire his company uh, for twenty million dollars before he even had a product, right? Because that he's a rock star. Yeah. But you is get Paul, drunk. or is that with John? Uh, Andy Grigdon? Okay, sure. But you get you get to know somebody like that. He might not be the guy, but yeah. he'll introduce you to other rock stars, yes. right? Yeah, who and, might be in play for your idea. Yeah, and and it's all possible. That's the thing. You have to know that it is all possible. I mean, if I think the world has changed so much where. People are, are generally more accessible than they were. I mean, he is sitting in, in Half Moon Bay, and there are, but there are people that know. You know. So if you want to meet that guy, come see Robert, and Robert well, will Well, he speaks to conferences. Go, go to a conference and, and hang out in the lobby. I used yeah. to go, you know, I couldn't afford conferences all the time. I'd hang out in the lobby. That's yeah. how I met Stuart Butterfield, who started Flickr. He showed me Flickr in the lobby at the uh, uh, O'Reilly conference, right? You, you can hustle your way into a lot of things. And it takes that, you know, I think to make your company happen, you're basically hustling all the time. And so I think showing people by doing, that's I think part of the game. So to end, end this, where do we uh, apply? So come to the website, extremetechchallenge.com. Yeah. Follow us on Twitter, there'll be more information there. The rules of engagement and the timeline are on there. Hopefully you'll be one of the companies that gets to present on stage in front of hundreds of thousands of people potentially at CES with even more media coverage than that. Nice. And uh, that'll happen between January 6th and 9th, but the notification that you, you'd be a, a semi-finalist, I think will be around November if I'm not mistaken. And uh, three companies will go on to come on to Necker Island with Sir Richard. Uh, February 6th is the date within the week that is Mai Tai Necker Island. Well, I blocked that whole week, so hopefully I get an invite yes. too. Yes, yes, looking forward to it. <laughs> but yeah. I might have to come up with a company or something. <laughs> Anyways, thank you for doing that, and thanks to Rackspace for sponsoring. Yes, thank you, Robert.